for that because I am behind time. All right, so hold your questions because I think that that's what's really slowing me down, though I, I have the knowledge to answer all of them. I hope I've made that clear. <laughs> um, but I don't want your question to go uncovered. Um, but steps to building your niche. So I want you guys to really look at this. I want you to check out your government services administration website, gsa.gov, because that's also going to show you um, – some of the local housing rates that are going for some of these niches. So if you are a consultant, right, um, it's going to show you what uh, corporate consultants are usually paying around your area to stay in your place, or, or an area around your place. Um, you can also do that for uh, families of hospitals, military, right? We have a big basis here in Maryland too, right? Walter Reed, we've got a lot of different uh, um, services that also cater to military and vets. So, you know, just seeing what those um, services are that are kind of in your area that people are traveling to to visit. All right. Um, you can also call the companies, right? Call the hospitals, insurance companies, military bases in the area and ask them, like, you know, you got a big conference coming up, anything that I need to go ahead and plan for, I'm offering this for my rental. So you can go ahead and establish those relationships. Um, and then figuring out what your niche is, right? So, like, for a military, maybe you want to put amenities like sleep machines, right? If you want to put international travelers, that's my niche. I'm going to look up what my competitors are doing that are also catering in my niche. To my girl who asked about what do you do for corporate rentals, right, I'm going to look at the corporate rentals in my niche and what amenities are they offering so I know to offer the same things, Right, so look and do market analysis on your niche. Affiliate market your niche, right? I told you guys, right, international travelers. How many different ways did I say I made money off that property? Eight. Eight different ways I was making money off that property by just catering to the international niche based off the affiliates that I was doing, the ATM machine, right, the different ways that I was thinking, all the things that an international traveler would need for my niche. That's not to say that you couldn't do the same thing for corporate rentals, right? Maybe you also let them use your car. Turo, right? Like thinking of different, what if, if I'm a corporate person, what do I need? Oh, I don't even have to go to Hertz. I can come to her, her house. I get to use the car and the house. Good ways to kind of make double money. Just thinking, right? Out the box. Um, so, yeah, so these are some of the people I've worked with, friends and also mastermind students. So James uh, specializes to convention travelers. So he's calling the convention. He sees a convention coming into town. He calls them and says, hey, can you list my property as an actual um, partner when you go and hand out your travel information? Right? So he specializes in just dealing with conventions, bigger things that are in the area. Um, Temi specializes in the hospital members. So she'll call and say, hey, is there anybody visiting, a, a large group of people visiting a certain person in the hospital? I have room for about eight people that could fit. That's only, um, I think her house is only um, a half a mile from Walter Reed, right? So it makes sense. Um, Viola, oh, for uh, insurance clients, right? So that's what she's specifically focuses on, insurance claim clients. So what's your niche? How do you protect your short-term rental? So yes, the insurance piece, right? So we talked a little bit about this, but things you must have, right? So um, for me, right, because mine was um, residential, but it also was a 10,000, it was based off the square footage and the occupancy, I did have to kind of have the commercial package policy um, that covered the building, the contents, the liability, and any income. Um, you just want to make sure whatever insurance you do use, um, that there's no vacancy. I mean, there's there's room to give money for when there's a vacancy um, and standard occupancy. So it's going to cover you when your property um, is not being rented. And there are companies that will actually, you can file a claim if you've gone three or four months without having anybody, uh, bless you, uh, without having anybody actually stay in your property because that's a loss of actual income, right? So looking at insurance companies that um, focus on that as well. Um, you also want to make sure that the insurance company um, will also protect corporations and partnerships, LLCs, trusts, right, because you don't want to be putting these properties in your name for any lease you sign, any, you know, you know you're putting your corporation on any lease agreements, any insurance agreements, right? So you want to make sure that insurance company also caters to um, your LLC and corporation. Got it? 
Y'all still with me? You're not falling asleep on me, are you? All right, make it sure. <laughs> All right, where to advertise? So look, I gave you even some, hopefully you guys are paying attention to the marketing. Just gave you all my sites. Jesus. Okay. But <laughs> Flipkey, HomeAway, um, Airbnb, Home for the Holidays, Vacation Rentals, VRBO, House Trip. Um, there are some, uh, Wimdu, which is a really big uh, German site. Um, Nimbus, which focuses on um, the Chinese market, so international travelers, if that's what you want to cater to. Stays, S-T-A-Y-Z. Um, and I listed some more to booking.com. Of course, you can also get your property on, which is I would recommend go big or go home, right? Go for the big ones. The penthouse was on booking.com, Hotwire, Expedia, um, really some of the bigger ones. Um, we were a hostel, so we're on Hostel World, Hostel International. Um, so we're on some pretty big sites. Um, also, I would be advertising them in groups, right? So there's different traveler groups. Um, on Facebook, LinkedIn, Yahoo, where you can actually list um, your property on those groups as forms of advertisement, right? So telling people, in, and these groups aren't small. They're like 10,000 people. Um, so you could go ahead and, you know, advertise in those groups as well. All right, so step by step for getting this off the ground, right? You have to do the market research to determine if you have a good short-term rental. Um, identifying your niche, right? So who do you want to target? Corporate rentals? military, hospital families, what do you want to do? And then I want you to also look at the features and benefits for your niche. So again, if you're catering to international travelers, making sure you have that roadmap for them to get through the city. If you're catering to nurses, what may nurses want if they're traveling nurses? Um, also looking to then um, furnish and take professional pictures of your place, right? So you can go ahead and put it on all these different sites. Um, I recommend at least 10 to 15 sites to advertise your, um, your property on. And you also, again, there are sites that cater to the niches, right? And so you can look those up as well. Um, so setting up the accounts, coming up with a catchy title, right? You don't want to just say two bedroom, one bath here in D.C. No, what, is your, what are the benefits, right? Features plus benefits, right? What are you featuring? What are the benefits of that feature by being in your property? Um, hire help if you need it. We're going to still talk through that. I haven't gotten there yet. Um, but if you need someone to do, if it's more than, um, you know, five bedrooms in a house, you have all these different people checking in, do you need to get front desk manager staff to now be there? Do you need to get someone who actually, which we had, I had a live-in manager, right? So I had someone who lived there, for free, but also worked in my business 20 to 30 hours per week. So they weren't getting paid, they were living there for free, in addition to doing the check-in and doing all the coordination of the maintenance for my property, right? So that was a really huge benefit. Um, market to every segment, and you know, make sure you're, you're getting your website up to then do search and optimization based off the keywords for your niche and implementing the profit centers, right? So again, just like I would never tell you in a nine to five to rely solely on that one income, right? I don't tell you go work your job and just depend on that income or salary. Same thing for Airbnb. Make sure you have seven streams of income within your Airbnb short-term rental property, right? So how are you creating those different, you know, sources of income through your actual niche? But Brittany, I work a nine to five and can't manage the property. Not to worry, there are some automation tools to help you. Guesty is one um, that we did move to towards later on in the year. Um, I wouldn't suggest it unless you're really doing a higher volume. Um, so I would say more than 10 beds in a given place if you're doing like a hostel. Um, but again, also if you're looking just to make a couple, um, you know, if you're only trying to make a 1500 to pay your mortgage, this may be great for you too because it is very hands off. So Guesty is a channel management. So they're basically going to do all the inquiries for you. So 24-7, they're going to respond to every guest that comes to you. And you have to pay them between a 5 to 10% off each booking that's made. So if you don't want any, if you're just like, I'm not really in it for this massive income goal, I want to go ahead and, you know, outsource it to somebody else, they're there to do that. 
And again, you could make this really high income if you have that, that uh, leverage and wiggle room to do. They also do the property management software. So if you actually plug in your people, your cleaning person, your maintenance person, they are responsible for then contacting them. So now they know when to call your cleaning crew to come in. They know when to call the linen service to have the linen be delivered. You just have to plug in the contacts and when you want that delivery to take place, and they will do the management for you. Again, it's going to cost, like I said, anywhere from 10, 5 to 10%. Um, but the management fee will put you higher, closer to like 15, 20% if you get the whole package. So they are taking a pretty significant cut. But if you really wanted it hands off, you could do that. Um, they also do autoresponders. So now you don't have to communicate. You know, you can just say all the directions, all the questions. You could go ahead and send those out to the guests all the way up into their stay. Gives you great good. It gives you higher ratings when you, the more interactions you have with your guests. Right? So it could say, all right, we, yeah, I know you're coming in a week. Here's the metro information. Okay, three days away, here's some restaurants you may want to look at when you get in. You know, you can kind of set up those autoresponders to go out on Guessy. Um, I was using Banana Desk when I first started out, so that was a small monthly fee. I liked it because it, the channel management was great, so I was on all these 20 different sites, but it was all coming and funneling into one CRM. And then um, my actual banana, banana desk is attached to my Podio. So anytime um, a lead came in, it dinged in my Podio system, and a VA knew to go ahead and respond to the inquiry. Oh, yeah, okay. It goes to Podio. Yep. Um, yeah, so banana desk is inter can be integrated, has APIs to integrate with Podio. Mm -hmm. um, so, but again, banana desk, I still had to hire my own VAs to do the inquiry. Right, so this is not a service that's going to do the management in terms of communicating for the guests for you. You have to do that yourself. So I had my VAs, right, $4 an hour, who are responding to guests to do that. Right? Um, they also, you can, there is property management software in there, but again, it's you having to do that coordination. But it's a small fee, so it's only $35 a month to have Banana Desk. Right? So that for me, I was like, that kind of, I'm doing it myself, so it just depends. Are you someone who wants it all done for you, or you want to kind of halfway do it, or just do it yourself? You know, you got some tools to help you. Um, and then, of course, the student interns, right? Because they're free 99. Everybody say free 99. Right? So, yes, you can have people who are coming in to essentially help, like I said, working your business, right? So they can stay in the property for six months as a study abroad, or, or not even study abroad, but like there are RAs of the property, yeah. right? So they know, everybody knows what an RA is. I was one, I was a head resident too. I had like the hottest um, apartment my senior year, which I left open and everybody always came in because it was the, one of the few like deluxe apartments because it was a head resident in one of the nicest buildings. Um, but yeah, so they're used to, um, you know, saving that money, right? They don't get paid, a, you don't get paid a stipend to be an RA. You get the free, um, free housing. Um, some some higher schools with higher budgets may give like a seven hundred and fifty dollars stipend for the whole semester, but it's not anything outrageous because you're getting four thousand dollars in savings, five thousand on room and board. So they know they're not getting paid, and then you work anywhere from ten to fifteen hours a week in the office. You take shifts, right? So you can have two people that are kind of, you know, managing the shifts if you want to, if you have a larger operation, right? If this is small in your house, a couple people, you don't need a full in staff, right? You can have someone just come, check people in, change the beds, be out. And a student can also do that too, right? So, you know, just some ways to think about it. Um, some also um, automation things as well. So the automatic locks. Right, so that's important. Um, people, I, I, I just learned at an early stage, the key thing was just too much drama, right? People lose keys, I had to go get keys made, it was just too much. So by putting automatic locks on the door, it makes it easier because then you're just giving them a code to walk in. And you don't have to be there to let somebody in. So now I can set aside, okay, you're, go up to your room, there's the code for your room, this is the door lock. Right, so now they also feel safe because they can, it locks their door. 
right? So no one is also, if there's other shared travelers, right, people have two or three bedrooms in a house, right? You're, I feel safe because my stuff is locked versus just a regular doorknob with no lock on the outside. So you can change your bedroom locks to putting the automatic lock on it. It's a good investment and saves you time because you don't have to be there. Um, I also use slide broadcasts. Um, that's when I want to go ahead and send mass messages to somebody. Uh, but the point being that when someone is confirmed, they're booked, they're good to go, I can just go ahead and send a pre-recorded message for that person. So meaning that, um, all right, so Shonda books tonight. Or, and, and as she books, slide broadcast will automatically slide into the number, telephone number that you gave me, and it will leave a, a, a message saying, um, hey, welcome to the proper area where you get in. These are the check-in times, and it gives the pre-recorded message. So you can do that. And if, it could be harder when you have international travelers, but you can always put that in an MP4 and also have it send automatically as well. So it's just a pre-recorded message with all the instructions, so it makes it easier for them to then um, listen to it and come into the property. Mm -hmm. um, yep, and of course, Podio, right? It's just that's my, been my workspace. I've been talking about Podio since 2014. Um, that hosts everything for me. All my, all my businesses are in Podio. So it's just my workspace and workflow for that. This is um, a screenshot of Guesty. So I know it's kind of hard to see, but this was from September for a client. And it just basically has the check-in date, the checkout date, the confirmation code, the guests, because all these guests had to be verified, right? So they have their own profile picture and who they are. And then it also says the listing address of where they were going for that night, because I have multiple properties that I'm doing this with. All right, again, the team. So who do you need? If you do want a front desk manager, depending on how many beds, the cleaning staff, right? So who is going to turn over your property? Right, who's going to make sure it's clean? Who's going to change out the beds and clean up after the guests? So that's something you have to have. You don't have to have a linen service. That was because I had right over 30 beds. So for me, rather than me having the manager spend so many hours doing laundry, it just made sense for us to just have fresh linens every, delivered every two weeks. Um, a VA would be great, too, to answer the inquiries if you are a little busy. So you can get somebody just to do that, a virtual assistant, and that doesn't have to be somebody outside the country, right? A virtual assistant can be an intern. It could be anybody who's working to help you move your business forward. Um, and then the lockbox, right, or the automated lock, right? That's a team member. It helps um, to be able to, you know, not have to be there to, to manage that property. But Brittany, what about Airbnb police? So let's just really talk you through some of the regulations. Um, so for Washington, D.C., Maryland laws, too, um, the biggest one right now in Maryland is in Montgomery County. So the zoning, they just did a uh, new rezoning for Montgomery County, and the only thing that they're saying now is that, that if your uh, place is in that area and you are listing it as a short-term rental, there's a, a different uh, state and occupancy tax that has to be associated for that area. So it, it's actually lower than you think. Um, it's only... 7%, whereas D.C., it's 14.5% for the taxes. Yeah. So Montgomery, area, Montgomery County is the first to ever really implement Airbnb law legislation, um, and they're really specific on focusing on the taxes that are now being divvied up based off the county. So that's one to look out for. Um, when it comes to the transient use of licenses, so let's talk about this. So in your Airbnb property, like I said, there's multiple different types of short-term rentals. So let's kind of talk through the different short-term rental strategies that you can use in your property. All right? Everybody say short-term rentals. All right, I see people falling asleep, and you don't want to be falling asleep on the, the laws part. Okay? Laws and regulations, let's not dip our eyes for this part. Okay? Um, oh, and I'm sorry, it's a little bit... Um, the screen's a little uh, low, but really quickly. So there's different types of licenses, right? So a bed and breakfast license, right? So I actually had to get a bed and breakfast license for the penthouse. The reason being is, is that because of the space, it is a 10,000 square foot penthouse. Like I said, the occupancy was over 350 people that could fit there. And because of the amount of beds, it put me, um, 10 beds and over is considered a bed and breakfast within DC. 
so I had to get the bed and breakfast license. Um, I could have gotten, though, um, Charles, you know, talks about the rooming house license. So in Maryland, right, you can have four unrelated people living in a, um, a single-family home that can rent weekly, and you can do that for all the rooms. That's huge. So by doing that, you have to make sure you get a rooming house license to do that. Is that? Um, three. Oh, yeah, sorry. Four unrelated people can be living in a house together, which means you could have three bedrooms being rented out per week, right, at $150, $125 per week, whatever you want to choose to do. And if that's considered now more of a rooming house, right, because sometimes you may keep them over 14 days. It's, it may be over that 14-day mark. So you could do that for 30 days, 60 days, you know. Um, but you, may, you would need a rooming house license to do that. Of course, the hotel license, an inn and a motel license, um, as well as boarding houses. So if you are going to um, apply for um, working with uh, com- um, convicted felons who just got out of prison who are doing re-entries, or if you're going to work with um, vets who need transitional housing, right, you can apply for even boarding houses or uh, government funding to then use for your house to work through uh, transition housing. But you still need a license to do that. Right, so there's still it's still Airbnb, it's still short term rentals. It's a little bit out the Airbnb scope, but just wanted to put that in your radar that you don't always have to do Airbnb, right? We could do short term rentals for transitional housing people who still need it. We could do it for a bed and breakfast license if you want. So people can pay a little bit higher amount because they know that they're getting breakfast included. You know, you can feature we want to think of the ways that you can be unique. How is your property unique from the competitors around you? What are you catering to in your market that other people aren't catering to? Right? So I, just want to, I don't want you all to think of just one thing. Let's look at all the different ones. All right? Um, well, so that's with that. And then, yes. So the only thing, too, with uh, Airbnb regulations that we should absolutely talk about. So the law on the table for D.C., though, it's said not to pass, is what, um, for people who are using their house as their primary residence, to then use short-term rentals. So what they're saying is that the laws on the table are now saying that they would like anybody who owns their primary house to be occupying that house at least X amount of time, depending on the zoning, depending on um, you know where you are. So some, I've heard it be up to 70% of the time, um, as low as 50%, depending on where you are, how many rooms, how much income you're going to be making off of it. Um, but even so, that still shouldn't affect... Um, you know, you in some capacity, especially if you have multiple bedrooms, right? So if you're there, the primary owner, and you're in one bedroom or you're renting out the other, right, that's still you being there in that occupancy. What they're trying to get away from is people who are literally, you know, taking, which is me, (laughs) let's just call it what it is, but I'm not living in the house. I'm renting it out from people who are not in D.C., Right? So another, my highest niche, and you can also write that down too, is also sometimes absentee owners, right? Because they're abroad or they're somewhere, and I'm saying, hey, you're not really managing, you're not really keeping track of your property, I can come in and go ahead and put it under a lease with you, and I'll make my X off the top, right? So that's what they're just, that, that's what the laws and regulations someone asked me, that's what's on the table right now. So saying that if you own a primary residence and you are going to do Um, short-term rentals in that residence, a primary residence, they want you to actually be owner-occupied X percent of the time because under your primary residence, you don't get taxed the same as your, you know, your um, investment properties. So they're seeing the people that are, you know, getting away with those tax advantages by claiming their primary home but also now doing that strategy. For investment properties, it's, it's still the same. So, it's, you know, that's not really the issue. It's more people in their primary who are under programs, too. So now you've got NACA government assistance, and now you are, you know, renting out that property. And NACA states that NACA is a first-time homebuyer program, right? And so it's going to basically pay that you don't have to pay any, um, any closing costs, no down payment. So if you get all those privileges, and then you are using it to then 
do Airbnb. That's what they're trying to avoid. People are getting those great programs and are abusing those programs. So anybody else using it as an investment property and doing it, you're in the clear because you get taxed different anyway. So just putting that into the space. Any questions about the regulations? I don't want you coming out here saying, well, Brittany said, and it's wrong, <laughs> okay? So I want to make sure we're all in the know about D.C. law, Maryland law, as it relates to that. Yep, and then I'll come over. I'll, yeah, I'll repeat it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, bed, yep. so bed and breakfast license versus the rooming house license. So rooming houses are only, um, they're basically saying that be uh, up to the limit of four unrelated people within a given house. So that's considered the rooming house, right? Bed and breakfast is based off the number of beds and occupancy that you have in that house. So it's a little bit different. Rooming houses has a cap on it, right? The four unrelated people that can only be in that house. So that you're not going to stack 10 beds in a four-person unrelated living house in Maryland. Bed and breakfast is saying based off of the square footage of your house, you can put X amount of beds for X amount of people. You have now bed and breakfast license. And they're going to tell you, they're going to come when they give you the license, they're going to be able to pull up the tax assessor's report and tell you exactly what you're legally allowed to do based off the tax assessor's report. So they're going to, they're going to tell you. Hmm? It's on the table. It hasn't been passed yet. The legislation is on the table that they, laws are saying that they want you to live in it 70% of the time. That law has not been passed yet. So I want you to be, keep looking as, you know, uh, bills are going to bait on the floor so that you can, you know, see if that gets passed. Right now it has not been passed. But that is what they are looking to move towards in order to regulate it so that, yes, people who get these great first-time home buyer programs are not capitalizing exponentially off of it. Yeah, so um, looking at um, U.S. Senate laws, house laws, they're going to be showing, I mean, even if you just type in Google right now, current Airbnb laws for D.C., right. it's going to be populating in St. The last one just came out in August, and that was, again, what was on the bill docket, which talked about that 70% occupancy. But again, it didn't get passed yet. It's just on the table. So yep. states doing their own laws as well? Yep, that's absolutely. So Jeff also asked a great question. Are states doing their own laws? Absolutely. That's why I said I'm talking just about D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Because there are certain states where Airbnb is banned. Wow. You cannot do Airbnb. Wow. It's actually a fine to do Airbnb in certain states. Yes, so state has legislation at a different course. Yeah, so there are certain even counties in um, um, California, right, where they were trying to get, it was just basically the 1% trying to get richer, which I, I get it. So they have these office buildings, these commercial buildings, and they're making them so cheap um, that even people who were residents couldn't compete with those prices. So they were renting out their corporate rentals at rates that, yeah, and had way better amenities. So you're actually putting out people who were trying to even compete in that space. So they banned it in those areas, and especially they banned it for corporations to do because you're taking away from smaller, you know, businesses who want to do that. So, yes, that's why I said let's talk offline if you want to talk about a different state because there are different regulations for different states. I'm just talking about D.C., Maryland, Virginia. Capiche? All right, so I make sure no one calls me out and says, well, Britt said. <laughs> yep. Oh, wait, right here, and I'll come back. Okay. With the exception of Oxford houses and recovery houses, which can be under federal law, yep. uh, and to avoid so they can evict, uh, isn't all this under state law? What else would be under federal law? Um, Try to think. Mm, what else would be under? Um, well, the, the mm, no. No, it's, it's still mostly under all state law. Yeah, it's nothing that's under federal law. Well, I mean, it's, you know, what's in the same. That's state. Yeah, it's on state. Mm -hmm. Yep, so it's still in states now. Yep, great question. I, don't think, I was thinking too, but, mm, yeah, no, still all within state, state discussions. Yep. So bed and breakfast and yep. You can do a bed and breakfast in Virginia. You can also, oh, so 
I, I can't remember what Virginia specifically, you can do rooming houses in Virginia, however, the limit isn't four people. I think it's only three. So correct me on that. I can't remember what it was specifically for Virginia, um, but you have to look at that piece. Mm -hmm. But they are two different things, rooming houses versus the bed and breakfast. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Great question. So that's going to be up to DCRA. Okay, so his question was, um, yep, so you are ready, you're pumped, you really want to help out and do um, a house for uh, a person with a disability, yet your house falls under the historical classifications. Therefore, and I've done a historic home, and that was the last, first and last historical home rehab that I did because there's regulations to how the brick had to be painted and down to the pipes that had to be put in the house, and it was a nightmare of a rehab. Um, so, yeah, it... Um, you have to look at the guidelines of the, your historic home, what could be done to it. Because he was saying, what if I want to put an elevator in there for, or a ramp for wheelchair accessible? And that truly just depends on the county, the, you know, what they're going to tell you to, that you can and can't do in the historic home. So that, that's going to be up to them. And it, I've seen it be different across the board, which is really frustrating, but it's not actually all the same. You can get grants to do disability um, um, repairs, repairs to make a house more livable for a person with a disability. Absolutely. I'm not sh on your historic home. You have to check within those guidelines to see if there's any renovations that are going to be covered or if they won't cover them. So we just you have to be careful with that. Mm -hmm. All right. We're getting ready. We're coming to the end. Everybody still doing okay? Is it good information or does it suck? Y'all wouldn't lie to me. Y'all are learning? Okay, I want to make sure. I don't want nobody to say they didn't learn anything today because then I would really feel some type of way. <laughs> All right, just making sure. All right, so documents to have your business in check. Again, I just really believe in the SOP method. Call me crazy, but I, SOP, again, is a standard operations procedure. The minute you take the time to map out your business from start to finish, the more efficient it is going to be, the higher profits you are going to receive. I don't go into a business venture just because it looks nice, because the returns look nice. I map out from start to finish what my time responsibility is going to be. Is this even worth me committing my time to, right? Weeks, days, hours. How much am I going to put in? What is the consistency of the calendar? On Monday, am I doing um, cold calling to insurance companies? On Tuesday, am I reaching out to hospitals to try and get more of my niche? On Wednesday, the linen service is coming, the cleaning crew is coming. On Thursday, right, I map it out for the entire week for my model, and I'm consistent, and I stick to it. My, my people who work for me know exactly when to come, when to head out, what needs to be done. That's how detailed you have to be because then you can really see where things are going wrong in your business. If you're just running with your head cut off, oh, this person checks in at three. Oh, the person is coming in to deliver. I mean, it's just you're going to go, it's chaos. And you're spending way too much time, right? And then it's not profitable because your time is being sucked into it, right? So who are you going to put in place to manage these things so that you are not in the forefront doing that, all right? Documents to have. So just making sure the SOP even for the front desk manager, right? They should know daily what they need to do every single day. It should be a checklist, right? They need to check off, I came into this room, I cleaned this room, I changed the bed sheets, check, check, check. So it's a, a checklist. So that at the end of the day, you can come in or once a week and make sure things were done, right? Give them that checklist and make it for yourself, Right? And that's the same thing we did with the money, because, you know, money is always the issue. Right? But I was checking, I checked every reservation to see which people pay cash and which people pay by card. And if it didn't match up at the end of the day, we had a problem. Right? No one's playing with my money. Right? So if you're going to have somebody else manage it, you need to be checks and balances as to what's being spent, what's being, you know, inventory, and what's coming in. Right? So I checked every single reservation to see which one was cash, which one was credit, did it match up, okay? Um, rules and regulations, Doc. So we didn't talk about that, but let's just quickly. Um, brings up a great case scenario too. But what are your rules and regulations about the people who stay in your house, right? So if Bruce says, hey, no wild parties, or I'm charging $500 each party, that's within your right to put in your rules and regulations, right? So 
and make sure you put no stealing. Apparently, Jeff and I found out that someone read the rules and regulations, and because it didn't specifically say no theft, he thought he could steal anyway. Again, one of these local U.S. peeps you got to watch out for, but, I, you know, again, people try it. I've had people, like, um, yeah, like, take, take stuff, say that, oh, this was my favorite. This guy told me that he lost his laptop, and, that, um, and somebody had stolen it, and I was, of course, responsible to pay for the laptop. All right, so I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, then, when my VA was posting Craigslist ads about our place, she contacted me and said that there was a laptop that was for sale right by my place. I'm thinking to myself, hmm, that is so strange. Like, the laptop was stolen, yet there's a laptop that's on Craigslist, kind of matches the description. Like, what's up with that? This person sold his laptop and said, I stole it and wanted money for the laptop when he had actually sold it. Several streams of income for him, exactly. Um, right, but I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, yeah, so I'm like, you're selling your laptop, you told me it was stolen, okay. So yeah, so rules and regulations, just saying you're, and you know, there's templates for the stuff out here that says, you know, you're not responsible for any theft in the property. If you do have multiple people, like I would say, you know, you're doing the bunk bed style, like I was doing, you would put lockers. So lockers protecting a hostel, you know, they can go in, have their own combination code. It's, you know, it, they can choose to lock their stuff up at will or if they don't want to. For corporate travels, it's different. It's a bedroom. They have the lock on the door that we talked about, et cetera. They're good to go. Um, but people in a shared space, that's where that applies. But what are your rules or regulations, right? If you don't want your corporate rental person coming in the house past 2 a.m., then you need to put that, wow. right? So what are your quiet hours, right? What's the, what's the rules and regulations for the shared space? Every person is supposed to clean up after themselves. Are they allowed to use the microwave? Are they allowed to have your food? Some people are nice like that. Some people aren't. Do you want to share? Do you not want to share that? Right? Are they allowed to touch your cooking utensils to make stuff or not? So just putting in there the descriptions of your rules and regulations for your house that best fits you. All right? Um, we talked about having the license, depending on what category your short-term rental may fall in. Um, lease agreements, if you're doing rental arbitrage, which is what I do, right? So... I am putting, um, like, I have a client who has three houses, so I have a master lease amongst the three properties at a flat, at a fixed rate, and then whatever I make off the top is what I make, right? So I have lease agreements for that, um, the states that they're paying the utilities, they're paying for um, maintenance repairs, and I am just simply getting paid whatever's on top for renting their place. Oh, yeah, so that's a good, another one. So do you want to cater to pets or not? That's up to you. I would usually say no because if you have, like, three people, you know, in a house and someone doesn't, isn't pet friendly, but maybe your place is exclusive to pet friendly. People may love that. So you look at your niche. Yeah, people love to bring their dogs with them, and that's, that could be its own niche. Yep. Yeah, so great. It depends. So she asked me, what is my lease agreement for? Um, if, I, if it's a really hot area... Um, I'm, I might just do a 12 month if it is one of those like seasonal areas then I may just do a 6 month and just do it from March to October and let them get winter tenants so I have to know what lease I want to do based off my market analysis for it is going to show you right when the property is the fullest and when the property has the least vacancies so you pay that $15 it's worth it to know your historical data for that property so you can determine what you want to do with it um, and like I said, the business plan, your marketing plan, right? How are you going to start marketing this property? How are you going to build your affiliates? So, and your calendar of weekly to do so that you are consistently running an operation. This is not a hobby. If it is for you, okay. But if you're really talking about making money and making this a business, then you need to treat it like a business. Yep. That does. But I, for breakfast, usually I see cereal, milk, juices, and then some people just do like light croissants, light, light stuff that they, you know, bought in bulk. Like apples, yeah. Some people do that as light breakfast. And some places don't offer that. So for me, I'm, I, I love when breakfast is included because I don't want to go out extra. I want it to be there. Some people, um, you know, 
don't care either way. So it's what that preference is. Hmm? That's true too. Yep. So just because it's licensed as a bed and breakfast doesn't mean you have to serve breakfast. But you know, if it's if you're advertising it as a bed and breakfast, then most people do say, well, it's probably going to be included. Uh, but that doesn't mean you have to. Yep. That's a great point. We talked about you know depending on yeah depending on where you are. Yeah. So if you're if it's just going to be for um, you know you're catering to groups, uh, your whole house six or more, seven, eight beds in your house, it's probably going to be a bed and breakfast because it's six different, you know, beds and rooms. Four, four separate beds? Okay, so it's four separate rooms. It depends where you are. We can talk offline. Tell me where it is. Tell me, and I can look it up and see what it may fall under because in Maryland, maybe you want to do it as a rooming house. Maybe you want to do it as a bed and breakfast. It just depends on what strategy you want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You should have one of the licenses for which one you want to do for an investment property that you're doing. Yeah, a primary, you don't need a license to do in your primary, it's your primary house. Because mm-hmm. you're doing it in your corporation. So, yes, your business, what is the business license that you want to do it under? Mm-hmm. Great question. All right, and then for my people who keep complaining that I don't have money to do the deal, again, right, I have private money queen, right? Um, I did a full presentation on this in April, so I'm not going to go through all of it in the interest of time. Um, but again, right, you have private lenders that are all in this room, right? People who have worked in past, for past employers and have a 401k or a 403b that they have not touched, right? How do you roll that money over into a self-directed IRA? And a self-directed IRA allows you to invest on anything you want to. It's self-directed. So you can invest in real estate, you can invest in stocks, you can invest in startups. It's your self-directed IRA, um, which is what I do. I have a self-directed Roth, and I also have a traditional. So, you know, when you're talking to people, right, you've heard me talk about this before, how can I, you know, get your credibility kit together, show them the business plan, show them what you want to do, how are you going to secure their money, is it your house, are you willing to put a lien on your house if it's a primary residence? or an investment property, um, if, you, um, if it's going to be an unsecured promissory note, how are they going to get paid back based off the monthly reservations? So are you going to pay them monthly interest payments based off the reservations that you get? Are you going to pay them out quarterly? What, is the, what are the terms? Are they going to earn an interest on it? Are they going to earn 5% interest on their money, 8, 10, 12, right? Um, And also Airbnb has um, a new pilot um, hard money lender, if you will, program attached to it. Um, I'm blanking on the name, though I've seen it so many times. But if you type in Airbnb funding, um, I see the logo. What's the name? But they will give up to $100,000. If you have a reservation that's already kind of making money, they're going to run algorithms to see exactly how much money you're going to make in the spring and primal times. And they'll give you a loan. Um, that you then have to pay back based off the bookings. So if you want to use that for renovations, for staff, for supplies, for anything, you can apply for an Airbnb loan. Mm -hmm. So something to think about. You know my favorite strategy, right, of finding lenders. I've raised $700,000 this year just from LinkedIn, right? So networking with people and pitching them about investing in real estate. So that's my niche. I did a training on that in April. That is, again, on the, was it April? It was a while ago, actually. I think it was January of this year. That's on the Real Deal Meetup site. I did a whole hour on LinkedIn and the strategies that I use to find private lenders. So I would definitely encourage you to look at that. Um, And just, yeah, making sure you have the docs in place, like I said, when you're going to do private money. Um, What is the, have you, if it's your house, make sure you run your title report the title insurance, if you're going to secure it with your property. Um, if it's unsecured, right, you're going to use a mortgage, um, uh, a promissory note. Um, and, you know, just showing them the lease agreement, things to have. Or you can partner with me. I'm happy to fund a Airbnb project um, that kind of fits my needs and criteria in the D.C. Maryland area. Of course, I have the money, so why wouldn't I offer that? Um, yeah, so or you can partner me. That's my vision board. This is what you guys, I'm totally into mindset and 
having my goals written down and what I want to accomplish because I truly feel like once I did that, I really started to elevate me. And so all I'm saying is, you know, when you think about your 2018 right around the corner, right, what is going to be your vision for your business model? What do you want to focus on? What do you want to kind of narrow in on? There's so many ways to make money in real estate, right? When I talked about turnkeys, rental, short-term rentals, wholesaling, rehabbing, and landlording, right? I've done it all. Um, but, you know, just having that level of focus, right? Which strategies are you going to focus on and, you know, kind of carve in? And if this fits your perfect model, if you already have a house that you could put up tomorrow, do it, right? Or we can, you know, go through some marketing things that we need to do in order to get the property in order to secure it. Yes, Bruce? Go ahead. Oh, true. Yes. So he's saying, of course, if you're going to put um, uh, money into the property um, and you're now going to have lenders, multiple lenders, I don't advise that strategy. I don't advise you taking five people to fund an Airbnb project. I've always only used two lenders max on a project. That was usually for the purchase and the rehab slash contingency cost. For Airbnb project, I'm only using one. So one person is going to fund the deposit, any furnishings that I have for the apartment, if I had to do that, um, any cleaning costs and supplies up front, as well as holding costs, right? I'm going to give them a return on their money, and I'm only going to keep their money for a year, and they're going to get paid out in the bookings that I have. Oh. Yes, you should have. Yeah, you should have a. If, yeah, you should have a business account, right? That you have. <laughs> yes, that you're not commingling into your personal account. As a lender, I want to be lending to a business account that's set up tied into the property's name. If it's not your personal um, Airbnb um, house that you have. Yep. All right. So how quickly can I do this? So let's find out. So I'm going to bring up real quick. Don't believe me because I know you guys are like, oh, Brittany just did it so quickly. And, you know, I did do a bigger one. That's very true. Um, but, you know, like I said, we have people in the room who are doing this strategy who've been doing it for, um, you know, less than two months. Um, so, yeah, we can kind of see where they've been. So I'm going to actually have Jeff come up. Jeff is a mastermind student and client who... Um, just started Elite Sleep 365. Um, ooh, I got to see the logos, but I didn't actually see what logo he picked. But yeah, just he's been doing it for how long? Two months. Two months? Okay. And so yeah, just kind of wanted to hear the struggles that you've had, some of the challenges, um, as well as some of the successes. So let's bring it up for Jeff. Hi, 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 hi. Hey, everybody. Okay, I had this house that was sitting vacant. My ex-wife moved out of the house. It was our marital home. She moved out, went to go find a nice place to live. The house was actually about to go to foreclosure. I was, gonna think, I was doing a short sale to a third-party buyer, and I was joining this other mastermind, and I heard about this short-term rental thing, and I was like, well, could it work for this house because it's vacant? It's um, currently set up as six bedrooms, three full baths, and then we're going to, later in the next couple of months, renovate the basement to add three more bedrooms, so it'll be nine bedrooms, four baths. And somebody suggested this hostel model. Right around the same time, I met Brittany. Um, and it was like, okay, I mean, it was God, honestly. Just like all these things happened, this whirlwind thing has happened. And it took me a long time to get the property license in D.C., way longer than I anticipated, but it was well worth it. Um, right now, with the six bedrooms, I'm renting five of the bedrooms. I do live in one because that's what the, the, the bed and breakfast license requires for my zoning. And we have 20, 20 beds right now. No, 22 beds right now. And I have not, I've only had one weekend where I've been completely full in the last two months. And it was crazy, crazy because guys were booking women's dorm rooms and, <laughs> and they're showing up groups of four and five. And I'm like, y'all aren't women. Our, you know, and our men's dorm is full. So we, I mean, it was a crazy shuffling. So 
I had to put some systems in place to check. Are you a man? Are you a woman? You know, because these guys weren't putting their profile pictures up. And so, I was, so even just as last night, I told a lady, look, you can't check in until you put your picture up. I don't, because you have a, a name that's foreign. She was actually Chinese. I couldn't tell whether it was a man or a woman's name until she put a picture up and said, okay, now I know where to put you. And we've had, I mean, and, just, and this has only been, it hadn't even really been officially two months yet. It's like a month and a half. And I've got stories a mile long. Um, my break even for the house is 7500 a month. And right now I am, and this is the slow, slow season. Um, I am, I've, I got my first mortgage paid last month, and right now I'm about four guests short of breaking even to make it through, through this next month. So it's a little bit of a loss, but way, I mean, you know, right. <laughs> it's still great. Yeah. And then talk to us a little bit about the managers now that you want to put in place and there's, it's a bigger, um, you know, operation than just a single family. All right. So, um, Brittany, I, you know, I hired Brittany as my coach because I was like, look, I want to retire over the next year. I've been a real estate investor. I should have said that in the beginning. I'm a, I'm a real estate investor. I've been doing this almost 14 years now. And I've, I've done, in terms of the rehabs and wholesaling, I've done well over 300 deals. And I'm, I'm, I was just like, I'm tired. I'm ready to get into a passive income mindset because l hustling from deal to deal is it's had its time for me and you know almost 14 years so now with hiring Brittany as my coach um, she's helped me say all right I gotta start hiring some people because right now it's just me and my son you know changing beds and all that stuff and I, and I, I did she has me doing that so I can know how to write my procedures manual you know, what, I, what needs to be done? What is my check-in procedure? Because it has been like this check-in procedure, been a big yo-yo. And so now I'm beginning to systematize some of those things, and I'm going to be hiring interns. My house is near, um, kind of near three different colleges. And um, so between the three colleges, I'll be talking to, you know, the, the guys and ladies who handle the internships. Um, over, over the next week, because the goal is within the next month to have uh, at least two interns living there and, and running the day-to-day. Because -day. actually, I just um, last week had a meeting with a lady who has a building in Foggy Bottom who wants it's 70 units, and I told her I want 25% of that building. Um, and I know somebody who's renting in that same building a couple units, and she's 100% occupied. And so, so I'm, my goal is to get, you know, 10 to 15 in that one building alone. So in order to do that, i got to finish systematizing this place so that I can move to the next one. Um, and it has been, you know, an incredible, incredible journey. To, I mean, because it took nine months to get the funding. Because um, all my private lenders are used to the standard buy, fix, up, and sell model. So when I po pitched them for this model, I had lots of, ooh, that sounds sighty, it sounds excess, uh, sexy. And, you know, they were asking for things like royalties off the top. They were asking for 50% interest in the business. I mean, I was like, heck no. I mean, so getting the funding, just, I just said, no, I'm just going to save up my own money and get it done. And so I did. Um, I haven't had to take on a partner, and I won't take on a partner. But this, this bigger venture that's coming, yeah, you know, if you've got four or 500 grand, yeah, come on, let's go ahead and do it. <laughs> so yeah, it's good. So yeah, that's it. Yeah, give it up for Jeff. And so this is his um, hostel. So it's Elite Sleep 365. And so here's the actual website. So if there's people who are looking to stay in the area, who you in the Tacoma Park area, please feel free to support right businesses um, for his area. So thank you, thank you. But again, like I said, so you guys are like, oh, Brittany with Secret Sauce. It's like you know. Um, you know, anybody can, you know, really do this if you put your mind to it. So it hasn't even been two months, and to pay a $7,500 mortgage is quite high. Um, I know that the penthouse, obviously, right, um, you know, 20 grand a month was not light money either. But again, it's just having systems in place, having um, a blueprint, right, for you to be able to follow. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Jeff. Um, really quickly, too.
Um, yeah, it's like, why do you have a coach right in the, at the end, right? It's lonely at the top, right, <laughs> truthfully. Um, and so I've known this, right, by working, um, you know, just in different capacities. When I opened up the penthouse itself, right, it was really hard because it was, nobody was in that space, nobody was doing what I was doing. And the real thing was few people really were able to do what I wanted to do. So when I said, hey, let's go to Puerto Rico or let's go to the Cayman Islands, nobody could go. Right? I had all this, I still do, I have free time, I have money, extra you know, reserves saved up where I can go do things and not the same group of people were able to do it. So you just want to be around people who are also doing deals. You've got like-minded people here who you can collaborate with. We brought you here for a reason, right? Not just to listen to me, but to also strategize with each other about how you guys can make deals happen in this room. Um, and so that's what I'm here to help you do. So did I deliver today? Okay. Don't want you talking about me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You guys are great. Yep, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to stay around, so please find me. And have a great rest of the holiday, and go good luck in 2018 as you think about starting to crush it. Oh, my number? Yeah. It's uh, 202? 888-DEAL, <laughs> 202-888-3325, that's myself, all right now.